Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Crystal Lander, and I'm the Chief Strategic Engagement Officer with Pathfinder International. Pathfinder is proud to partner with Chestrat Global, AMREF Health Africa, the Alliance for Reproductive Health and Rights in Ghana, the Primary Healthcare Strategy Group, and Village Reach on this important topic of reimagining 21st century global health and national primary healthcare systems in Africa. This is a virtual conversation and a post UN General Assembly um, forum. Today is just the start of a conversation around primary healthcare in Africa. We thought it was a really important conversation to have, initial conversation to have following the UN General Assembly so that we could keep the conversation going throughout the next year. You will hear from our amazing group of speakers on all of the opportunities for civil society and small NGOs to engage in what is happening around primary health care globally. We know that everything that's globally really is enacted locally. So it's very important for us to be educated on what's happening and also find opportunities for engagement. We will have a follow-up conversation in December and then another conversation in March at the AMREF Health Africa Conference in Rwanda, and then again in May at the World Health Assembly. It is again imperative that we hear from you today. In the chat box, we will allow you the opportunity to uh, not only tell us who you are and where you're from, but also to get the conversation, add comments to the conversation. We ask you to use the Q&A box for questions specifically for our panelists. Throughout the webinar, we will take those questions and answer them either verbally or in writing. But again, we wanna hear from you now. So please start posting your name, your organization and your location. Next, I wanna turn over the microphone to Dr. Peter Singer, Special Advisor to Director General at the World Health Organization. He's gonna kick off the conversation on how we can really strengthen development and some of the conversations that came out of the UN General Assembly around um, global health and development, particularly primary health care. He will be followed by Christina Wiggs, who's the vice president at PAI for a response around the role of civil society. So over to you, Dr. Singer. Thank you so much. Um, it's really a privilege to be here. Uh, and I just wanted to say how important this conversation is. Uh, it focuses on Africa, it focuses on civil society, it focuses on, on primary health care. And these are the the key issues. And a, a special shout out to my friend Lola Dare, who's doing such excellent work uh, in, in country and in civil society. We've had a long standing uh, working relationship. In the next uh, four or five minutes, I just wanted to give a bit of a situation analysis about where we're at, some of the lessons of COVID, how to think about things maybe in a, in a simple and integrated way and then how civil society can get involved in the very exciting events that are happening next year. And I'll do all that very, very quickly because I know we'll have lots of time for back and forth. So firstly, where are we at? Uh, unfortunately, as a result of COVID, the world is going at about one quarter of the pace needed to reach the commitments that countries made for the sustainable development goals. And COVID showed us that no country was fully prepared for an epidemic, a pandemic of that scope and scale. So where we're at is in a relatively precarious situation. Um, and, uh, and that's really the problem that we all have to work together to address. In terms of the lessons of COVID, there were really three lessons of COVID. Uh, and those three lessons were equity, equity, and equity. Mm -hmm. And whether you're talking about within a country, whether you're talking about among countries, really questioned, I think, some of our values about whether we truly are our brothers and sisters keeper, whether we truly love our neighbor like we love ourselves, because we sure didn't act like that in, in COVID. And, and so I think the realistic view is one of uh, uh, self-reliance, one of leadership, which is the most effective vaccine, and, and really one of enablement and empowerment of every country in the world, every region in the world, uh, to strike a better balance, maybe, shall we say, in the strengthening development mode between charity alone, and charity is wonderful, and self-reliance. Um, and that's important in all kinds of ways, and primary health care gives that. So if that's where we're at, and that's the key 
moral lesson in terms of foundational issues, then how do we think in an integrated way about moving forward? My brother, Dr. Tadros, likes to talk about uh, the P's, five or six P's, and I'll just say them very quickly. Uh, he talks about promoting health, uh, in the sense of uh, getting to the root causes of health and preventing people actually from becoming sick in the first place. So think about how obesity, for example, affected people getting COVID. And of course, think about the most existential threat of all, which is climate change. Tedros talks about providing health. And here he's talking about primary health care, not only access to essential services, but also financial protection including services like uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, of which he's a, a, a strong uh, advocate. And the way that primary health care is calling for radical reorientation of health systems towards primary health care, which uh, can address 90% of the problems that, of course, means community engagement, means so much uh, multi-sectoral work in addition to the essential services. And in a sense, it's the glue that binds together health promotion, health service delivery, and the third P, which is to protect, protecting ourselves against uh, future threats. And here, I'll just highlight the pandemic accord where the governments of the world are negotiating that through 2024, the financial uh, facility and the universal health and periodic review in terms of key focal points on protect. The other three P's are power, partner and perform. Uh, so power is, you know, if we're going at a quarter of the pace, the question is, how do we accelerate? We accelerate through better data systems, and those are in countries with national statistics offices and health, health ministries. We accelerate through a tighter focus on delivery, tracking progress and overcoming barriers. And of course, through digitization. We also accelerate through innovation, and that's why the mRNA technology transfer hub and, and other uh, local production of vaccines and diagnostics and drugs is so important for that self-reliance. But not only uh, health products, also service delivery models. If you think about the service gap in mental health and the need, for example, to have, uh, for example, an innovation like uh, group psychotherapy in, in Uganda or the friendship bench in Zimbabwe. Um, and then, of course, partnerships are so vital. Uh, most of all civil society partnerships, and we're going to talk about that in detail in this uh, webinar, but also partnerships among multilateral agencies. And then finally perform with uh, WHO as, an, as your essential multilateral uh, uh, partner and a commitment by the Director General to work very closely with civil society. And that's where I'll end, which is my last point, which is with all these things happening, uh, and all these events in the next year, how can you become involved? Uh, I mean, if I, were, if I were joking about it, I'd say follow Dr. Tedros on Twitter because he engages everybody on Twitter and he's extremely avid for civil society uh, voices. Um, but in addition, I should say, uh, WHO will also be launching shortly a civil society commission. And so please watch for that. It'll be inclusive. It'll be a way for everybody to engage. Uh, why? Well, in part, next year is very important year politically with the UN General Assembly, the UHC, the Pandemic Preparedness and Response, uh, but it's also WHO's 75th birthday. And uh, each and every one of you is WHO, so I truly hope that you will join with us to celebrate this birthday and really to come back to the roots of equity that were so important in WHO's constitution 75 years ago and learn those lessons of COVID that until we love our neighbor like we love ourselves, we'll keep seeing a repeat of the inequities that we saw in COVID. So thank you, uh, Lola, for the invitation to all the friends here. And uh, those are the introductory remarks and uh, I'm very happy to continue to engage in the webinar and on Twitter at Peter A. Singer. So thank you so much and back to you. Thank you. Over to you, Christina. Unmuting myself, there's always somebody. Uh, hi everybody, it's wonderful to be here with you this morning. My name is Christina Weggs. I'm Vice President of Global Advocacy and Programs at PAI. I'm joined here as well by my PAI colleague, Elizabeth Lopez. We wanna thank you so much for inviting us to this important dialogue and especially a thank you to Chess Strat, who's the longstanding partner, who's a convener of this dialogue. Um, 
just a little, little bit about PAI in case you don't know us. We are a global NGO. Our mission is to work for a just and equitable world where everyone can fully realize their sexually reproductive health and rights. Um, we work on advancing universal access to SR SRHR and health equity through advocacy, through catalytic partnerships, which we'll talk a little bit more about, and the funding of change makers. We're very privileged to work in 120 countries alongside 36 civil society and youth-led organizations who are advancing advocacy and accountability for health equity and universal access to sexual reproductive health and rights, with a special focus on primary health care and universal health care. We also work to expand and strengthen the ecosystem of civil society actors. When I was invited to share some opening remarks for this panel, I was asked to talk about some of what we've learned in terms of partnerships. But I was really uh, struck by one of the, 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 the titles or sub-themes for this discussion, which was strengthening development across multiple tsunamis in a complex and interrelated world. And of course, I thought, well, we'll be talking about the multiple and intersecting crises that we know we're facing in the world, from pandemics to conflicts, food insecurity and famine, economic crisis, um, and then crisis related to climate change. And how do we build systems that can weather these crises, um, which we know will keep coming? And how do we build back health systems that are much better equipped to sustain essential health care, even during times of crisis? As we heard from the previous speaker, we saw that we really lost ground in women's and children's health um, during the COVID pandemic. And we want to build back better so we're better prepared next time. But, you know, talking to Elizabeth, we thought that we also wanted to talk about how collectively we weather the tsunami of multiple global health initiatives and financing systems, which I know that the second panel will talk about as well. We have PEPFAR, ENAP, FP2030, PMNCH, UHC2030, and not saying that all of them aren't critically important. But there's a lot of them. And then there's also the Global Fund, Gavi, Stop TV, Global Financing Facility. These are all very critically important initiatives. But how do we work to make sure that they are not top down, that they don't build vertical and siloed systems, but we really leverage the energy behind these initiatives and the investments coming through these initiatives to build resilient and functioning health systems that serve everybody, that don't just serve people with resources and power. And how do we make sure, and we have a special interest in this as an NGO and a CSO ally, how do we build in transparency and accountability so we can detect and correct gaps in equity, quality, um, and access in real time? A few comments that I'd like to share about what we need to do now, and I know that our next panels will talk more about this. We very much need to think about financing. We need to build reliable financing that builds whole health systems and not, not vertical health initiatives, which also brings together all stakeholders to invest in country-driven health systems. And what's really prioritized is advancing universal health care and shows up primary health care systems. Um, we think that the GFF, for example, has great potential as a financing mechanism because it crowds together multiple sources of funding and ensures that we don't sideline women's and children's health, including funding from the private sector, donor funding, and national governments. I know we still have a ways to go for the GFF to live up to that mandate, but we think that's a really important model. Um, I know that we're all watching and tracking the development of the pandemic preparedness and response funds such as SIF, and I think we all need to really work to ensure that we leverage them again to strengthen primary healthcare systems and not build vertical systems for pandemic response. Um, we also know that it's really critical that civil society, including youth-led organizations, have meaningful roles in shaping the investments and priorities of these global health financing mechanisms. We're privileged to host a civil society engagement mechanism for the global financing facility, which is meant to ensure meaningful engagement of civil society, including youth-led organizations, in shaping the GFF investment cases at the national level and driving accountability tracking progress, but also engaging with the GFF at the global level. Later on this month, we're going to be convening over 70 civil society organizations in Accra ahead of the investment group meeting to bring civil society's interest to the table there. And I wanna say that our, our CSO and youth-led partners are all committed to leveraging GFF investments to shore up national universal health care plans and to ensure that we're making investments in effective primary health care and to ensure that SRHR is not sidelined but is prioritized. 
Um, on our second panel, we're going to be talking about the critical importance of investing in primary health care. And as the first speaker mentioned, we all recognize that that is a game changing investment if we want to ensure universal access to health care, but also systems that can withstand shocks and crises. One thing that I want to point out is a special part of this is thinking about how we invest with frontline healthcare workers. Those are the workers at the front lines of healthcare. Often those are women, often they're underpaid and working in very unsafe working conditions. So we need to think of them as critical partners. In some ways, I think of them as human rights defenders on the front lines of healthcare service delivery, and we need to invest in them. And I also think we need to think about civil society groups and civil society organizations as part of strong primary health care systems and community health systems. We know that those community groups and organizations were often the first to detect disruptions to health care during COVID. And they're often on the ground over time, the first to detect equity gaps, quality gaps, access gaps, and offer locally relevant solutions. Um, throughout the course of my career, I've seen that bringing community groups and civil society at the front lines of service delivery and dialogue is a way to identify and address those gaps in real time. Also, we know that these groups are trusted and respected and well positioned to respond when there is a disruption to healthcare services, such as during COVID. And I want to share two examples from some partners that, that we really hold dear. In India, the CSO Sayagog worked with health officials in Uttar Pradesh. Um, after health sub centers were closed at the during the first wave of the COVID pandemic, they partnered with health authorities to open four uh, temporary health clinics, basically asking as force extenders for an overstretched health system. Um, our colleagues Kemet, um, in Kenya found that healthcare services were being disrupted by COVID. Um, often with healthcare workers that diverted to other services. And they collaborated with the Department of Health to pilot these roving teams that included some healthcare workers, but also a trained cadre of youth peer outreach workers who were able to offer door-to-door -door services, create safe spaces and do outreach and reach over 11,000 young people with SRH or information and services, including contraception, often at a time when those health clinics we're not serving those, those communities. So again, we need to think that CSOs have a critical role, not just in terms of extending the health services to the community level, but we need to invest in CSO-driven ongoing feedback and accountability mechanisms where civil society groups and communities are listening, monitoring equity, access, and quality of healthcare, and again, pushing for locally relevant policy solutions. But we need to build the systems that elevate that real world, real time data into national policy discussions so that we're talking at the national level, we really see the gaps that are happening at the local level and, in, and acting quickly to address them and holding governments accountable. I also wanted to say that the civil society really must be at the table to shape health budgets and priorities. Again, monitor progress and drive accountability for governments, for donors, for other duty bearers, including INGOs at the national level. I wanted to share a great example from the African Health Budget Network in Nigeria. They've developed and they're using an accountability scorecard where they mapped out the government's commitments in Nigeria to um, their COVID recovery plan. The, the government of Nigeria developed a COVID-19 recovery plan to restart and sustain reproductive, maternal, newborn child, elderly health, and nutrition. And they're using the scorecard to track progress over time and how well the government is doing in meeting its commitments and sharing that data with CSOs and journalists to hold the government accountable. Um, I guess I want to stop by saying this is not just about protecting years of investment and gaining lost ground in women's children's health. This is about rights and justice. And uh, really, um, we're here to, 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 to make sure that everybody everywhere gets the health care that they deserve and they need. I'm going to hand it back to you because I know we have a long panel, but I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and hand it back to Crystal. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Peter. We have a, a minute for a few questions and both of you hit on some really key, some really key points around prevention partnership power came up in both of you, the power to be at the table and make the decision, the power to um, bring that table so that it, more people can be around it. I just thought those were really um, um, important points. Uh, performance, the system has to work and it has to work for everyone. And we see that. Um, so great, because y'all both are on the same page coming from different perspectives. But coming out of this, you know, UN General Assembly, we, I mean, 
we know that this is a big part of our life. We participate in these conversations. But coming out of this big meeting, what would be the one thing that you said, you know, coming out of here, everyone should know, particularly everyone being civil society organizations, that woman who lives in Kenya, who is saying, how does this change my life? How is this yet another meeting going to make the difference in my access to health care? And, um, and then I have one other point that I, I love that, you know, uh, Peter, you talked about the climate connection because we're, you know, moving quickly into the COP27 meeting, which has been ne uh, named the African COP, COP because it's going to be in Egypt. And, you know, most recently we saw the flooding in Pakistan. And we and, and it was noted that 114 health clinics were, were lost in one day. So all this investment in primary health care was lost in one day. And so I can't help but think about these connections between these two real important meetings, um, UN General Assembly and COP, and how, to be honest, the global health community has not been as involved in this environmental uh, conversation in these climate conversations. So I wanted to take advantage of that, this opportunity to start with you. I'll start with you, Christina, and say, what's the one thing coming out of this UN General Assembly that you want you you wanted people to know and that you wanted to share? And then over to you, Peter. Um, the one thing. Um I, I'm gonna I'm gonna share a quote from Dr. Tlaleng um, Mofo Kang, who is the uh, special rapporteur on the right to health. Um, I heard her speak yesterday, and what's interesting is you asked what 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 should women know? What 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 should communities know? They already know. They already know that they live whole and integrated lives, and they need to receive integrated holistic healthcare packages close to where they live. I think what's important is that we listen to them and understand that we have to build those primary health care systems that offer integrated care and respectful care and equitable care. Um, and so to, to me, I, I feel like maybe what I hope people here and what I hope we deliver on is to really double down on this commitment to sort of not just make these commitments at the global level, but make sure funding actually flows to countries and is and that the investments made at countries are shaped to meet country level realities that civil society is at the table to make sure that community realities are part of that and that we set up systems to track whether that funding is delivered right to the front lines and whether we see changes in equity access and quality at the front lines and right. honestly you know i um around around your connection with 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 uh the cop in some ways, it's the same thing. Like we, we, we know that the countries that are contributing the least to climate change are are bearing the the brunt of climate change, right? And so we need to think about building resilience. And to me, a really critical really part of building resilience is again investing in these strong primary healthcare systems that have the ability to withstand shocks and crises. I'll hand Great. it back over to Peter to see if there's anything to add. Absolutely. I mean, if I were going to focus on one thing. And this is what you're focused on here, it's primary health care. Think about it as a house. You know, there's different rooms in that house. There's the essential services, there's the financing, there's the community empowerment, there's the working across different sectors of government. Those are all the rooms in the house of primary health care. But if you're in a house of primary health care, what's most important is your foundations. And the, the foundation of primary health care is equity. The foundation of primer and primary health care is the right to health. And the foundation of primary health care is health as a political choice. And uh, so all these things are so critical. And on the equity, you know, it was a very sad and discouraging experience. Mm -hmm. to see a health worker in a rural African setting who is risking her life to care for others with COVID uh, go unvaccinated when, uh, you know, teenagers in rich countries work. I mean, it's just disgusting. So you got a house of primary health care, you got the foundations, but you also have the roof. And if you think back to the previous experience with primary health care, we probably didn't measure enough. There, were, there wasn't enough metrics, including, by the way, the social accountability metrics of civil mm -hmm. society. And there probably wasn't enough, okay, where are we right now? How are we doing? Why is it stuck? How do we solve problems? So 
the one thing for me is the house of primary health care with the various rooms that I mentioned, the foundations and the right to health and the roof, which is the metrics. And when you're in a house, you got to look up, you got to look down and you got to look around and you need to welcome people in that house. And I'll go back to the point I made before about WHO 75th anniversary and just welcoming the joining of hands with civil society uh, colleagues, because it's really the only way for us to make change together. And if COVID showed us anything, it is that change is needed and leadership is the most effective vaccine. Thank you. Perfect words to end on. I, I love the ideas, like we're all WHO. And I think um, it was very interesting before COVID, you know, my family never paid close attention to really what I did. But then when after it was like, all of a sudden they're like, oh, I remember you go to the WHO. And you're like, I keep telling you this is important to everyone. And so uh, of anything, maybe a positive come out is for people to recognize that WHO was for everyone. It wasn't, you know, just for some countries, it's for all of us. And we have to invest in it and support it and understand that when the reason why you didn't know about other um, pandemics is because they didn't get to that point. They were prevented and the research is done and these things happen all the time. And I think with primary health care, it's if you have good primary health care systems, most people don't even know they exist. And that's the difficult part. Um, and I love the house analogies. It's like, hey, we have all these rooms in here, but we need a strong foundation to that house or we'll not last. So thank you both. You got us kicked off perfectly for this conversation. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lola who is going to moderate panel one. Wow, what an excellent start. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you so much for setting the pace for us. And also pointing us to where civil society can interface. I'm very happy to welcome my friends and colleagues, Vinod, Emily, and Crystal to join panel one. Panel one is going to share experiences that they had in responding to COVID in the context of primary health care. Civil society at country level was fast and nimble. We all innovated. We all were running with our feet and without materials to work with. So innovation was the core and reaching people in urban slums, in rural areas was critical. So what did you do, Vinod? Vinod is the chief, of, chief executive officer of Medsource in Kenya. Emily Bancroft is the president of Village Reach and she will share with us their work on vaccinodromes. Medsource in Kenya has done excellent work on technology and assured medical supplies to the last mile. And Crystal Landa is going to share with us what happened to the health workforce and how can we make it better. Over to you, Vinod. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for having me uh, as part of this, uh, such a vibrant panel. Uh, yes, like you said, uh, started off quite well uh, with uh, Dr. Peter and uh, Christina uh, taking us uh, to a next level in terms of the discussion. So uh, Metsu's group, uh, it's, it's actually a novel approach in the supply chain management to promote access to quality uh, assured uh, PHC commodities and supplies to patients in the last mile. So it operates uh, as a med fintech integrating uh, distinct uh, interrelated cogs of a robust supply chain. Uh, where we have kind of, because it was difficult to approach uh, in person, uh, we have automated uh, the onboarding uh, of the members onto the platform who can actually accept, uh, whom we can accept as a duly registered member with enhances compliance to the pharma regulatory framework. Uh, track it trace uh, is one of the features that we, we kind of got on into this uh, technology platform that we have as we operate as a GPO. Uh, we also try and safeguard patient safety even during the pandemics and Q&A should, uh, the quality and the quality assurance should never be compromised. Uh, we also brought about evidence-based data for decision-making. By that, I mean, uh, we tried and got people to know what product is available at what prices and in which, which space or which environment they can actually go to and, and get these products from where uh, the basic products like gloves and masks were totally unavailable. And hence, without that, you couldn't uh, even get to the patients. So with most of the METSO members uh, serving, being, I mean, serving the last mile, METSO successfully covered 83% uh, of the subnational governments in the entire country. And at the height of COVID pandemic, the unique contribution by METSOs of ensuring supply chain continually was validated by METSOs winning about uh, two prestigious government awards for that time. Uh, and through, well, Christine, Abel, uh, Peter and Christine also spoke about financing. So METSOs, uh, 
kept innovating to understand what the market needs and what the customers need so as to strengthen the healthcare supply chain. So we came in through an inventory financing uh, kind of working capital solution to address members' uh, financing pain points and thus ensuring that their businesses remain afloat. It is difficult to survive, but at least they remain afloat while providing guarantee to the suppliers that uh, a secure business environment is assured to them as well. So Metso supports the supplier balancing the, the credit risk. Um, we, we, also, we also learned quite a bit of lessons in terms of expanding access uh, to the quality assured products. So uh, we, 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 we kind of understood that platform preparedness or ICT preparedness is key uh, during whether during the pandemic or in any business environment because uh, the world is moving towards technology and technology needs to be adopted and adapted uh, in terms of proving, uh, providing to be the best possible solution. Uh, seamless logistics with service providers, uh, which we tried and integrated in terms of giving visibility. So distributors and manufacturers, this needs to be put on, on, on priority list. Stakeholder engagements, uh, being at the seat of decision-making, COVID-19 National Secretariat needed to come together. And hence, if we can have the National Secretariat working not only during pandemics, but throughout the phase of uh, providing for healthcare and healthcare service provision, if it can be, it can be better coordinated, we could have a much better, much better uh, platform where people can actually get access to not only quality, but also, I mean, not only, not only quality products, but also quality services. Timely communication to the members, both upstream and downstream, uh, so as to address information gaps and lapses could actually be one of the lessons that uh, Metsource could provide to both the public as well as the private sector in terms of how do you strengthen the service offering that you have. Well, striking the right balance of the members upstream, uh, Metsource partners with upstream members who control almost an estimated of uh, 60 to 70% of the health products and technologies in the country. This mitigates potential challenges of stockouts and the hassles of scouting for distributors, well, actually in a situation where you don't have products that you can, uh, you can, or you don't know the source where you can get products from. So Lola, with those few comments and remarks, maybe I can hand it over back to you of uh, having spoken of what we do, what we have learned and what we have been able to provide in terms of strengthening the healthcare supply chain system in country. Over to you, Lola. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vinod. So in, in summary, um, supply chains were disrupted. Facilities didn't have drugs, they didn't have medication, and people didn't have access to these important supplies. The MedSource intervention deployed three main interventions, technology, inventory finance, and communication with the, with, with the panel of with the, with the healthcare providers to ensure that we, they restored supply chain system and were able to co co cover about 83% of the population even during the pandemic. Thank you so much. I'm sure people will have questions for you in the Q&A and I'd like to hand it over to my, my dear friend, Emily Bancroft of Village Rich. Thanks Lola and thanks everyone. Great to be with you today. Um, I guess my, my sort of opening statement is also where um, I think it's, it's the opening and the closing statement, which is, you know, the, the one thing that that we take away from all this work is what we've taken away from, I think our work in the last 22 years. And I think that many of you feel as well, which is if we truly design healthcare delivery in a way that meets the needs of the most underreached communities, not only do we deliver better primary healthcare today, but we also create systems that are more robust and that can handle the shocks and the challenges and the pandemics and whatever else the world throws at us. And I think it's that design element, it's that piece um, that is so critical to the work that so many of us all do here um, in this conversation today. And that is the thing that we need to take away from this experience, which is that it's, you know, whatever we do to design in this moment, if we're designing with that in mind, um, we're going to be both better prepared today. We're going to deliver better care today, and the system will work better in a pandemic. So just a little bit about Village Rich in case you don't know us. Um, we work with governments um, in Sub-Saharan Africa to build responsive solutions that make sure that medicines 
um, vaccines, supplies, and information get out to the hardest to reach communities, and really with this eye towards how do you design around the needs of the most underreached to strengthen primary health care. And so the story that I want to talk about today um, in terms of, of how we've seen these lessons that many of the other speakers have touched on around equity, around access, around what we've learned during a pandemic and how we design better moving forward, I want to talk about a model um, that was used in both Cote d'Ivoire in Abidjan, um, as well as in Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this was really around the issue of how do we make sure that we get um, COVID-19 vaccines out to adults uh, who, you know, aren't necessarily usually the ones who are accessing vaccines and primary health care services at the facility level. So when we started, and I'll, I'll use the Kinshasa example because I think it's a great one. Um, in December of 2021, you all remember, we had sort of had a bit of a false start with the vaccination campaigns, you know, where I think we counted 100 days before, as Peter said, the first um, healthcare worker finally got vaccinated in Africa, 100 days after uh, healthcare workers and others were getting vaccinated in other parts of the world. There was a huge sense of relief, I think, from all of us that finally things were going to start moving, and then everything stopped. And so fast forward, you know, that's happening in, in April, May, that time frame, everything slows down. And so when you get to that time of November, December, when all of a sudden vaccines start flowing again, we've lost so much traction. We've lost so much um, of, the, of the sort of the demand and, and the desire that was there. And, and you have people saying, I don't know about this anymore. I don't, I don't know. And so demand is very low. So in Kinshasa, um, you know, there wasn't, the, the vaccines were coming in, but those resources to actually think about how are we gonna get the vaccines out to the people that needed, those were still running behind. Those resources weren't there. And we found that the initial strategy for getting the vaccines out was to use the primary health care clinics that existed in Kinshasa. Now, in a city like Kinshasa, you know, large population, the primary health care clinics actually are sort of spread around the edges of the city. And so for the for the urban poor, for people who are working, you know, they leave their house very early in the morning. They travel in um, to find work, to do work, to go to the market, whatever it is, and they come back very late. And the, the primary health care system was designed around a sort of nine to one you know, one or two day a week model of vaccinations. And that doesn't work for this population. And so looking at that, we were asked to help accelerate. What could we do? How could we look at this differently? What could happen differently to sort of show what's possible with how we get people vaccinated? And so really looking at what was gonna be convenient and accessible to the specific urban population um, was what sort of launched this idea of a vaccinodrome. So a COVID-19 vaccine specific site where people could come that were placed in highly trafficked areas that had long hours that were built around the times that people were moving through the city and also on weekends when they might have slightly more time and um, would ideally create and, and were de designed to create a very pleasant patient experience or client experience, you should say. So quick to get in and out of the site, um, you know, respectful service, and this was all designed with Ministry of Health staff, and this is all staffed by Ministry of Health staff. So this is not, you know, some other group coming in and doing this as Ministry of Health staff, but it's around helping them think about how do we do this differently? How do we do this outside of, of how we've usually delivered care? And just in the first few months of operation, we found that, that one of these sites was actually responsible for 18% of the vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccines that were given in Kinshasa. But now that was not enough because 18% at that point when less than 1% of the population was vaccinated was not sufficient. It was great to see that there was uptake, but it wasn't sufficient. So, so what did we do? We wanted to be vaccinating more like a thousand people a day at these sites to really show that, that they were starting to meet some of the need that was there in the community. So there were four things that the team did at that point. First of all, they started working with the community health workers in the neighborhood around the site. And what we found in bringing in the community health workers to the vaccinodrome and engaging them and talking to them about how they could do outreach in the communities was that pretty quickly, 50% of the people coming into the site were brought in by a community health worker. So where, you know, many of the, the sort of belief at the time was that people didn't want to get vaccinated, you know, combining convenience with actual personal outreach seemed to start to change that 
that picture. The second thing was, we thought, well, you know, it's nice that there's one convenience site, but that's not really sufficient. So instead of putting a lot of resources into one site, why don't we think about how you can set up a number of these sites in the city, make them a little bit smaller, really leverage partners to say, who has a tent that can be used? You know, who has um, staffing that could be used? Who has, you know, how do we sort of leverage this? And so we, we created a plan with the ministry and set up additional sites. So in the end, there were four sites. And we positioned these, again, based on where there was heavy traffic throughout the community. Um, and one of the most popular sites was near a church. And we found that that got really heavy access on the weekends. Um, so it was sort of interesting to see the different, you know, sort of looking at the data to see the different makeup of these sites and what was really changing about the traffic through them and what that said about the community and around them. The next thing was to say, you know, maybe this isn't convenient enough because community health workers were coming back and they were saying, well, I talked to this family, I talked to this person and they were coming, but this still actually isn't convenient enough for them. Okay, well, let's take these sites and let's make them hub and spoke models. So let's make this the base of operations. This is where the vaccines come in. This is where they sit. But then from here, some of the staff that were, that were staffing the center, why don't they start going out and doing outreach with the community health workers into some of these communities where people were saying it still wasn't close enough. And by the end, we found that about 68% of the vaccines at the end of this time, the 230,000 vaccinations that were done out of the site, uh, of these sites, about 68% of them ended up being done through outreach. So even this super hyper convenient model of being in urban areas still wasn't convenient enough. That outreach was still a critical part. And then the last thing that we did was we started incorporating other services. So we said, why don't we also offer routine immunizations at these sites? So three of the sites decided, you know what, we can do that we can also offer routine immunizations. So a parent comes in, they get vaccinated, they can get their child vaccinated as well. And this only started a few months ago. And just in two and a half months of doing that, a thousand children were vaccinated at these three sites. And 12% of those thousand children were children who had never been vaccinated. They were zero dose children. Zero dose children. And, you know, Peter talked about equity, equity, equity. This to us was the really key piece, right? So this convenience, this accessibility, this combining of services, which Christina also talked about, that all of a sudden, I mean, 12% of zero dose kids, you know, we have, I'm, I'm in Geneva right now. Gavi is, you know, this is, this, is, this is all anybody can talk about right now. How do we reach more children that are not coming into access services? So to have 12% of these thousand kids that were vaccinated during this two and a half month period be kids that had not been vaccinated before tells you that there's something to be said about this model. So, so what we take away from this um, are a few lessons that in some ways are so incredibly obvious. And yet I think what this shows us is if we do these things now and in the future, we really can change how care is delivered. The first one is convenient access is key when motivation is low, right? So people, you know, they weren't knocking down the doors to get vaccinated. Uh, but they weren't necessarily opposed either, but it had to work for them. And I think that is a really key takeaway from all of this. Um, community health workers, you know, we, we can't say enough about this. I'm sure Crystal is gonna talk about this uh, when, when she speaks, but community health workers were absolutely critical. More than 50% of the people that came into the site came through a direct referral you're being walked through that door by a community health worker. So that one-on-one -on -one communication, that one-on-one -on -one interaction was critical. We know that, you know, for getting people into care every, all the time. And we know this for getting people into care during an emergency situation. They're trusted, people listen, and they need that one-on-one -on -one conversation sometimes to get them over the hurdle of moving forward on something that maybe they know they should do or maybe want to do, but it helps them get over that hurdle. Another takeaway is integrating sort of emergency services with routine services can actually have an incredible impact. And I think right now, this is a really important lesson, right? Um, we, you know, there's still, still COVID-19 vaccination campaigns going on. How do we think about leveraging every dollar of those campaigns and combining them with other services that make it as easy and accessible as possible for people to get the care they need? And lastly, experiencing what good primary healthcare looks like is inspiring to the health workforce. So I think 
we can't like even though this was an emergency situation the health workers that staffed these sites they go back to their own sites or they rotate back into their day-to-day -day jobs with a different vision of what is possible they used data every week and they really looked at what people needed they looked at how people were responding and they were resourced to respond to that data and to change what they were doing they were empowered to make decisions about whether to do outreach that day or whether to do, you know, work more with the community health workers, or whether to change something about how the site was set up. So that experience people bring back into their day to day work, and that will shift. As long as they are supported, that will shift how they think about care moving forward. So how do we just make sure that these lessons aren't forgot forgotten? How do we make sure that we're always bringing that perspective of convenience of accessibility of what people really need, and that data in? Uh, to both design services today and to make sure that we're designing services that are stronger in the future as well. So thanks, Bula. Thank you so much, Emily. It's very reassuring to ask us the question, what does good primary health care look like? You seem to think that from, you present to us from DRC, it looks like community health workers, outreach, people-centered, citizens engaging, and also addressing the very issue of equity, taking this to where people really need them. I was very intrigued by the zero dose children. We'll come back to you after yeah. the discussion. Yeah. Crystal, we've had yeah. community health workers at the center of this. Um, uh -huh. What's your take? Well, it's, it's just so much. Like uh, everyone has just inspired me so much in these conversations and it's exactly what I thought it would be. Um, so I work for Pathfinder International and it's a sexual and reproductive health and rights organization. And so sometimes people are like, well, what do you like? What's the connection to primary health care? I don't get it, community health workers. But it's exactly what Emily was talking about is if we do not see the integration of this, this care and this work together, we are not really delivering for the people we're, we're supposed to be helping. And we really see that the integration of sexual and reproductive health and rights work as a part of the primary health care system. It has to be a part of that framework, part of that house that uh, Peter talked about earlier. And those health workers are key. We saw that um, particularly during COVID, of course. So, you know, health workers are going around and educating on uh, reproductive health, steering um, pregnant women toward health clinics, checking in on uh, young people to make sure they're getting information, correct information at health clinics. But what we also saw is those, the women in those households were so key. And many, we know that the majority of health workers and particularly community health workers are women, but we saw them, they were key to saying, I see a fever, someone is sick. They were the ones reporting out. And we knew that that healthcare started at that home. And in that community is where those health workers were talking to one another and reporting to uh, district clinics and district hospitals on trends and also being that educator. And many of them put their, frankly, their lives on the line. At one point, there was that heightened response and, and just such a scare, scared uh, terror going through communities around what COVID was. And you saw health workers being beaten up, attacked. Uh, these are the same health workers who lived in their community that they were working with before, but they also stayed in it. Many of those health workers still said, I'm gonna still be committed to my community to make sure they have the right information and stayed and they delivered babies. They get, you know, helped with immunizations. They did all of these things and they served as that linchpin between that district health clinic that could be an hour away and that local community where they were really, that they're from or are close to where they live. And we just saw that bravery that was so important. And again, that face was women, that face was female. And it was a period of time where you saw on social media where, you know, health workers were telling their stories. They were saying, look, this is what's happening where I am. And uh, with the equity that we talked about earlier and that shared power wasn't there. You had health, you know, ministries of health who were just wringing their heads of like, I'm not sure what to do um, because they had malaria that they had to deal with, but they had COVID coming around the corner or already in their communities. And so we were just um, at Pathfinder. We were just happy to continue to work with ministries. That is just, you know, Emily brought it up. 
the role of local government is so important and we have to support local, we talk about local answers and solutions that comes from the local government also taking this on and investing, strengthening primary health care services in their community. And sometimes um, it is very, uh, it is very um, challenging to resist funding for siloed pieces of work. But the reality is we know that investments have to be made in strengthening that foundation so that the health system can withstand another uh, tragedy, triumph, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, bending of it. it. It's important that we keep investing in it because there will be another issue to address. There always is. There's always another health crisis. I remember when Ebola came and everyone's like, oh, we're good. You're like, no, we know the next one is coming. Something is always coming. So we need to make sure we're investing in that foundation and can keep it going um, no matter what happened. Even with COVID, we know that there were some emergency funds. And I love the idea of like, there's an emergency, but there's the ongoing development that needs to happen. And we need to do better, I think, with that balance. I think um, our community, global health and development community, focuses a lot on the emergency, but we have to make sure we pivot back to the everyday. Because every day women still get pregnant. Every day women still deliver babies. These are all these things. Young people still need immunization. Every day this goes on to education and having youth be able to continue on in school. All of these things are linked and we have to make sure that we don't um, stifle the development train because there's an interruption in services. But I wanted to go back really quickly to the health workforce. Um, I, I was so pleased at this years WHA, where I saw ministries of health sitting down with each other and talking to each other about how they were going to make connections and learning from each other. And I think it was one of those times that meeting was a little bit smaller and it was a lot more conversation. And we need to continue that. We um, they, they had civil society sitting with them and talking and really thinking about regional responses to some of these things. And I know we'll have a panel later on about the politics of all that that plays into it. But I was so happy to hear people talk about, well, we use this health force measure here and you should try this idea there. Um, it was great to see Francophone countries getting in on the mix. Um, sometimes they're left out of the Anglophone conversations. And I was really just so proud to see that happen um, and be able to be a fly on the wall for those conversations and only participate as needed. Uh, the reality is, is that this is locally led and we want to be a partner in all of this. So. Um, I know we're going to continue this conversation, but just know that this is really powerful. We have to keep this focus on primary health care going, even when other things come up. We have to make sure that we're investing in the health workforce and not robbing the health force um, out of low and middle income countries for higher income countries because we need them too. Um, I think that is an important point that we have to be really careful about. The lure of a lot more money in another country is hard. So, we, but we have to be equitable. We have to really put our money where our mouth is. If our values are supporting the countries, then why are we robbing them of health workers as soon as they staff up? That is not equitable. And we know that that's not fair. So Lola, I turn it back over to you. I am really excited to hear from the rest of our speakers. Yes. We've listened to three examples of quick and rapid innovation during COVID, and most of them have started learning pre-COVID. Can I ask each one of you to answer one question? Because we don't have much time, because that's, my, my notes are full. Um, to Vinod, how is this sustainable? What did it cost? How do we replicate or amplify this across other countries so that commodities and supplies can reach the last mile? In our survey during COVID, we found out that the immunization system was also robust, but private sector was giving services even to the last mile. Is this replicable? What shall we do? To Emily, it's very good to see that access needs to be close to client. Access needs the community health worker. Access needs much more than money. But many times we say more money is what we need, but more money and more effectiveness and, out, and outreach is what we need. But I, I wonder how can we scale this? What is integration in your context, in that context? Because we have been talking about integration, integration, integration. Emily, what's your word on integration? And to, 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 to Crystal, we celebrate this community health workforce, but we don't train them. They don't have a career pathway. We don't even invest in them. Most of them are volunteers. In Nigeria, the, 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 the risk they took, the, 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 they were so critical to the success of the response at the last mile. 
and to the last person, yet no one was training them and we can't give them PPEs. So the risk to them was really high. And if there's any other panelists would like to jump into the question of how do we get PPEs and commodities in an equitable way, because that was the biggest experience for us at country level. No PPEs, not that there were no vaccines. There were, there were vaccines, but there was no PPEs. There was not just nothing to respond. How do we motivate a workforce without supplies? What needs to change for us to have, to know what good primary health care looks like? What needs to change? We not one minute each, and then you can have a wrapping word. Okay, great. Thank you, Lola. Uh, definitely a very strong question. Uh, is it replicable? Yes, it's replicable and it can be activated in every country. It's just that, uh, of course, uh, the government needs to buy and the private sector needs to be ready to accept technology and, and ensure that the change happens. A uh, few key success factors that I believe uh, or I see through the experience that we have had is healthcare financing has to be sustained to meet the regional and global commitment. Example, uh, the Africa Health Strategy 2016 to 2022, if we can look at it and roll it out into implementation plan and then a follow through of the implementation plan. Investing, definitely investing in human resource for health, uh, accelerated adoption of technology, like I mentioned, and R&D and innovations uh, in the field of technology so as to strengthen the supply chain. Uh, we should actually also look at how do you intense and actualize the North-South, I mean, uh, the develop to the developing countries uh, partnership on HPT manufacturing and production, uh, probably even pre-positioning of the HPT manufacturers for future pandemics, and also to strengthen uh, the near, near about or the neighboring countries in terms of availability of, of goods and uh, products. Uh, one more point I could probably look up is uh, efficiency of at the regulatory level, harmonization of the tariffs, uh, quality assurance and uh, post-market surveillance, if this can be strengthened, we can actually have a much better healthcare supply chain uh, in country and throughout uh, throughout the uh, continent and beyond as well. So over to you, Lola. Emily? So what does integration look like? I think what's interesting about this example is it was, you could almost call it reverse integration, right? When we talk about integration, we often talk about, okay, well, you know, so in DRC, they were integrating the COVID-19 vaccine into the primary healthcare facilities that existed. And what the vaccine drums did is flipped that a little bit, said, let's first make this convenient and accessible to adults, which was the target population for the COVID-19 vaccine. And then, oh, wait a second, they're actually the caregivers of children as well. So how do we think about bringing these two things together in a different way? And so, you know, again, as I mentioned, these aren't lessons that we don't know, but I think it's that sort of flipping the, the model sometimes and, and maybe just stepping back and saying, we've, we've thought about integration in one way, how else can we think about integration? Who are we putting first in this integrated model? And the resources needed for this are not that, you know, not that extreme. These were these were temporary sites. These were not, you know, physical infrastructure, but it was thinking about how you move the infrastructure around in the community and how you temporarily set up different spots. Those are the types of that integration can happen at any time. So how do we flip that that thinking a little bit um, from where from how we've thought about integration previously? Thank you. And Krista? I'll be quick and just say, we have learned and health workers have demanded that if I'm putting my life on the line, I want, I want a plan on how this will work. I just don't want to uh, be given what they said. Uh, we don't want applause. We want payment. We want, uh, we want a pathway. We want, we want a future. And I, again, we, again, we talked about it being very women centered. We, it is not fair to say you're wonderful, but we won't pay you. We're not sure what your future is, but continue to keep doing all the hard work. That is unacceptable. And thank goodness no one is accepting that anymore. We need plans so that community health workers who want to be nurses can be nurses and doctors. And we need all of the health workforce available. And we need to respect that um, they, they want career paths in these things and not um, push them into a path where it's the lowest rem on the ladder. We, we, just because it makes our lives easier or it's cheaper for a project. We, we have to, the equity comes back to equity. I wish we had more time and I could bring in Peter to say, how do we ensure equity? I don't know if Peter is still on the call, uh, on, the, on the webinar. Equity, 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 equity. What is the equity? How do we shift the equity dial? Because we've been discussing equity for a very, very long time. 
if Peter, P Peter, Peter, I don't know if you're still, if, I, if you can still hear yeah. me. What's the, key, what's the key thing that we need to do to shift this equity dial? There's equity for women, there's equity within the issues, there's equity in financing, there's equity in access. The PPE is nearly drove me crazy. How, yeah. how, how do well, we shift the equity needle? Yeah. We have to go beyond the moral persuasion. So what do we do? Because moral so persuasion for, doesn't, seem to be, to, doesn't seem to have shifted it much. So how do we shift the equity issue? Self-reliance. It's the only way. It's domestic finance. It's a look around the region. You asked about commodities and PPE. Where's the N95 uh, production factory in a political region where the countries can count on each other? Uh, with the vaccine, for example, to take another example, uh, I saw my colleague Martin Fried say yesterday, you can produce about 100 million annual doses of mRNA vaccine in a small facility that costs $10 million. So that's the, uh, you know, and it's also can be reprogrammed to different types of uh, issues. So where's the mRNA vaccine production factory in a political region where the countries can fully rely on each other? So we talked a lot about the health workers and that's at the very center of this, but you asked me about commodities. And one answer to equity is self-reliance and very concretely, that means local production. It means at least at the regional level, local production of PPE, local production of vaccines, local production of, uh, of medicines, because unfortunately, and this is the saddest lesson of the pandemic, is you can't rely on distant people to love you as, as they love themselves. Uh, and so you have to love yourself and self-reliance becomes uh, really important. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so, it's, we really need to close on this session. We are around three minutes or five minutes of, of a session, but I'll leave you with three things. One, we can scale innovation. We can scale innovation. We can learn together regionally. We can learn together at country level. So let's do that. That's part of what we need to reimagine. Not what we can, we have not done, but what we can learn together. I love this. We don't need to pay only. We don't need the applause only. We need integration. We need uh, to be paid as health workers. We need to be respected when we, we need to be valued. And so I would leave you with that. Finally, I would leave you with a word on integration. The discussion on integration is just starting. We're going to have integration play itself out in many ways. Join the discussion. Thank you very much for this session. I will thank the panelists and hand you over to Crystal. Thank you. That was so great. I love all the points. I'm listening in as part of the audience like everyone else. So we're gonna quickly move into our next panel on health policy and politics with Dr. Frank Aswani, Dr. Lola Dar, and Dr. Peter Karusu. And um, this conversation, I'm gonna start with Frank, um, and Frank is gonna kick us off around the money. You heard money come up a couple of times. Um, it's a lot of financing facilities. There's a lot of payment platforms. Frank, help us understand what is what what are all these platforms? What are they? Um, how and most importantly, how do they get down to the people who need it? How do we make sure it's civil society who is benefiting from all of these platforms and these payment and these financing facilities? Thank you, Lola. Uh, uh, thank you, Lola, for, for 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 this, and thank you, Crystal, as well. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, healthcare is very close to to my um, to my core and to my values. Um, I spent 14 years working for a pharmaceutical company, Eli Lilly, and uh, covering over 27 countries across Africa. And, uh, you know, everywhere you go as an African who's grown on this continent, um, healthcare is in your face. You can't run away from it. Uh, and if you can't see the, the I, I don't call them challenges, opportunities in healthcare, then you're blind in many ways. So, uh, so I'm Frank Aswani. I run, uh, I'm the CEO of AVPA. We are a pan-African network of social investors. And these are investors deploying grants, debt, and equity into the impact space. Um, the problem we're trying to solve, and it will contextualize my conversation around uh, the financing bit, is how do we help Africa um, address its SDG financing gap? Uh, so let's start from there, first of all. So um, I'm not sure whether you know this, but um, the continent pre-COVID um, required between half a billion to $1.2 trillion annually 
between now and 2030 to meet its SDG financing goals. Um, uh, that's a lot of money. And, and that's, um, you know, if you look at our social investments, traditionally we've been a continent very dependent on aid and government funding. Uh, in the tail end of Trump's era, you saw he cut USAID funding um, and we've seen the UK government do the same. And if you think about the two sectors that are most dependent on, on aid is healthcare and education. Uh, those generally are seen as public good sectors. Uh, so it starts throwing you some big hints that, uh, you know, we've got to start thinking about the challenges of addressing the healthcare financing gap. Um, secondly, our the other source of capital for our money or financing for healthcare came from government funding. Uh, but our government funding, you know, none of us uh, is unaware about this, faced huge problems in, in, um, in covering some of the just demands of COVID. But even pre-COVID, our taxes collection across Africa was about half a billion dollars. So we put $50 billion of aid and about half a billion dollars of government collection. On the SDGs broadly, we were facing a huge uh, gap. COVID made that worse. Uh, and it's assumed that it's, it's almost doubled the financing gap on the, on the continent. So, so you know, this is this is something that we have to wake up to. So, 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 so that's that's one of the things from a macro level. Now, what this means, if you ask yourself, so what happens? Where do we get money from to cover this? The only place where we can find money is the private sector, um, and the private capital markets, um, you know, are about four hundred and thirty trillion dollars. Uh, yet our global, not just African, our global SDG financing gap is about four trillion dollars. So we need about one percent of what sits in the private capital markets. So how do we convince, convince the private capital markets to invest in social investments like healthcare and other SDGs? Um, when, whereas they find them very uh, risky, they don't understand them. Um, so there's a whole uh, kind of uh, fear of investing in social investments. So I spend a lot of my time trying to see how we can work with private capital players to put more money into the SDGs, including healthcare. And so we, we, we spend a lot of time talking about how we can de-risk social investments, but broadly trying to bridge the extremes between philanthropy or aid and government funding and really advance this middle space where we are blending capital and blending resources and blending competencies that come from the two extremes. So we're big proponents of looking at innovative financing models and um, looking at how we can use our, our grants creatively um, in so doing so that we can crowd in private capital. Now to that end, we also spend quite a bit of time trying to change mindsets on both sides. On the on the traditional philanthropy and aid side and development side, the big uh, mindset we're trying to shift is that we need to change our our thoughts. That uh, generally people tend to think that that sector, and I say generally, that that sector can only absorb grants, and that's not true. We need to be open-minded about uh, certain interventions in the healthcare space. Um, being able to, uh, to uh, adopt or take in more commercial capital, and in so doing, probably uh, guarantee more sustainability of some of those innovations. Secondly, um, on the private capital side, on the other extreme, is we need to we keep talking to the private sector about uh, profit and purpose not being mutually exclusive. You can do well as you do good. So, so, so that's the forms the basis about the lo a lot of the work that we do at AVPA, uh, and we support investors through a couple of different ways. Uh, one of the ways which you do work is through um, capacity building and training, especially in this impact investing and sustainable financing space. Um, the challenge we have on the continent is that despite Africa being the biggest impact opportunity, if you wanted to do anything around impact investing or sustainable finance using an African institution, you have one choice. The whole continent has only one university that teaches impact investing or sustainable finance. Go figure that. We are the biggest impact opportunity in the world, yet we only have the University of Cape Town with an impact investing program. That is a shame. It's akin to having the US as the biggest car, car market, having one car manufacturer. So when you start looking at addressing some root causes, um, those are some of the things we're trying to address. So we're, we're working with a group called the uh, Impact and Sustainable Finance Consortium Faculty, which is a group of about 100 global business schools that teach this subject. To, and we've created um, a train the trainer program uh, that we're going to teach, uh, recruit and teach up, up to about 40 African business schools on this subject so they can set up their own departments of impact and sustainable finance. That way we can do this training at scale. We can, we can train our government officials at scale, do policy research support at scale, um, train foundation uh, and government officials at scale. That's the kind of stuff we, need, we think we need to do. Um, the other thing we've, we've looked to also look at is to just 
you know, right now, if you, uh, UNECA released a report that says the African investment opportunity in healthcare is about $66 billion. But many private investors don't look at healthcare as an invest as a sector where they can actually invest, create change, and make money. They tend to think that's 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 a sector that's just for the governments to play in. And that's why you find very few healthcare-focused funds on the continent. So, so we're trying to address to change that. So we've just created at AVPA. Uh, and super excited about this, uh, an African Healthcare Funders Forum, in which we brought together African healthcare investors. Um, they're going to go through almost like a, a, at a minimum a 15-month program. The first three months we're on to right now, we're, we're, we're taking them through an impact investing program. Uh, and in this session, we've got investors and some uh, social entre entrepreneurs, uh, and we're teaching them about how to apply and adopt impact investing approaches in this process. So, 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 so there's a lot of human capacity and human skill development we need to do on, on the on the supply side of money, uh, working with investors. Um, and another really exciting uh, and my, my last uh, comment, um, uh, Crystal is uh, Crystal is, um, we're looking to do a really exciting project around catalytic investment now, catalytic capital is capital to use to de-risk social investments uh, so we can crowd in private capital. And to give you a case in point, uh, and I'm happy to share this case study, it's a very nice case study coming out of Mexico, where there was a, there was a, a, a clinic that was doing uh, diabetes services around Mexico City. Um, now, someone wanted them to go into the rural areas. They said, no, we can't because we don't understand the, the rural customer. And someone said, okay, we'll give you a grant to, and we'll take the risk of you going to test your model in the rural areas. But if you do succeed and you find a model that works for your business, you can then put in your more commercial capital. And these guys went, got this grant, went and tested their model and realized, hey, actually, there is a market for us out there. Uh, and subsequently, they scaled their business across the country. So this is why you use grant capital as catalytic capital to take risks where more commercial capital will not be able to, will not be able to do. Uh, so we, we, we've got a grant from MacArthur Foundation as part of uh, the C3 Consortium. The C3 Consortium is a catalytic capital consortium uh, composed of MacArthur, Rockefeller, and DFC and Omidia to run Africa's first catalytic investment training program for grant makers next year. And in that program, we want to bring in governments as well, because I strongly believe governments are our biggest grant makers. If we can get generally our grant makers to think not one-on-one -on -one in terms of the money that they give through traditional grant making, but think for every dollar that I have, can I unlock 10, 20, 30 dollars of other capital from other players, especially private capital players, um, uh, and see if, if I can amplify the impact of, of my investment. So, so there's a lot of work we're doing there. And then the last thing, we, we were super excited. Uh, we, we've, um, we've got someone who's come to us to help us um, think about piloting um, catalytic pool funds um, across Africa. And we're going to do three pool funds, one for health, one for water and sanitation and one for agribusiness. And these pool funds are grant um, pool funds that will be used to especially support early stage uh, social enterprises that are in those three sectors to get through the initial um, hurdle um, to the point where they are more um, investor ready to take in more commercial capital. And because we think um, social enterprises have a huge role to play in filling some of the gaps that uh, either nonprofits or governments cannot fill. So I'll stop there for now. You've said a lot, so I'm like, I can't wait to come back around to you. And I think you've given us an education on this financing piece. So um, thanks. I will be back in a moment. Um, Dr. Lola, so over to you. So you, you and I agree, we're always talking about the money has to get to the people and public citizens have to demand what they they deserve. And we heard that earlier around um, with the, with. Uh, with Peter talking about essentially you, you know, people can't love you more than you love yourself. You have to demand it. Like that was, that was a good line there. I love that. So how are you engaging citizens to demand some of these things? And I mean, we just talked about the financing piece, but we, citizens have to be engaged. They have to be educated. They have to um, be, you know, encouraged to participate because they don't, they don't, they may care about this, but this is not their full-time job. So how do Public, how do you engage public citizens on this and get them engaged so that they get the rights that they deserve to be perfectly honest? Thank you so much. And uh, I, I'm, really ex I'm really excited to be here and to share with you what we have done with citizens in terms of expanding their access to care, expanding their capacity to finance their own health care in the wake of COVID. Um, Pre-COVID, we were working on primary health care and advocating for primary health care. But COVID was a it was both an interrupter, an integrator, 
and a learning curve for us quickly because it was rapid and fast. And all of a sudden, communities did not have access to healthcare anymore. They were locked in. Economies disrupted. And so in our effort, again, supported by a few of the other of our partners, we tried to look to, re, to reestablish their connection with healthcare. And one thing was very stuck. Like somebody said to us, I do not want a vaccine, not because I don't want a vaccine, but because if I leave my trade, I've lost enough already. I've lost so much money since the lockdown. I cannot leave here and go and look for a vaccine. So they wanted the, the services brought next to them. They wanted their health, their economies re restored. So there was a big, big fact that, just like Emily has said, our, our citizens were not rejecting vaccines. First, they were not available to them where they leave, work and play. They had two lockdowns that totally collapsed house domestic economies. Three for the young person, worse than collapsing economies, it had taken them out of school and out of education. And so we had social disruption in Nigeria big time. As the wake of COVID, we had what we call the Sorosoke movement. The Sorosoke movement is about speak out loud. We need economies, we need jobs, we need our businesses to be invested in as a part of the COVID recovery expenses. But no COVID recovery intervention had financing for businesses. So we started working with communities and with like minds like Frank and other people to say, how do we integrate financial inclusion and financial services for women and young people as a critical pathway to access to healthcare and bounce back from COVID? We called what we had did and we worked with Pathfinder in Nigeria as well. So I don't forget my dear friends, Ediri and Amina. And we started looking at bouncing back and building better. So we say citizens bounce back, PHC build better. They go hand in hand. We started last year with what we called community dialogues at citizens hubs. We intended to create 10 citizens hubs and PAI also worked with us in terms of amplifying the advocacy with a broad range of local partners that I cannot even begin to imagine. We learned a lot from the citizens themselves that they know best how to do this and they know best what they need to be able to access healthcare. And so in the citizens hubs, we had several citizens conversations similar to this, but with people, what do you want? How can you do it? And how can you be self-sufficient? Because it is a reality that aid is not going to do everything you want to do by yourself. Government budget is not going to do everything you want to do by yourself. What do you need to ensure that that self-sufficiency is progressive and is able to help you to, re to bounce back on your business and access healthcare? We also negotiated, and I don't know if the Lagos state government and the Ogun state government is on the um, on, and Oshun state government. We also negotiated the basic package of care with government. The, uh, the government already had the access to the basic package of care, but the informal sector, which is more than 80% of the Nigerian population, they do not have access to that basic health care because they don't know how to collect the premiums from these people in an organized and rational way. And so we first we said to government, they can't afford this basic health care. Can we negotiate, if we reach a threshold of X number registered, can we get a discount of pulled discount for communities that are recognized in the citizens of? I must say Lagos State was first to jump on that and to give them a discount, a generous discount on access to the basic health care package if they organize the citizens hubs themselves. So we organize citizens hubs. We started with 10 citizens. We thought we would have only 10. At the moment, we have 21 citizens hubs. And it's organized, the city people organize themselves around cooperatives we could invest in. A condition for the investment is that you have to pay your health premiums. And so by financial inclusion and financial services, we're able to help them to get discounted rates to access their health premiums. This is really very exciting for us because it shows that the, the ignored population in Africa, in, in Nigeria, especially, and I'm also related to Nigeria, who are in the informal sector can actually be reached to healthcare using financing and financial inclusion as a leverage. But then we stuck hard, hard core difficulties with the banks because financial inclusion means that, and financial services means that they would get a, what, what we called an empowerment support became what government is calling a loan. So we need the banks to de-risk the investment in health so that the, the, the local woman, the local farmer can, can have a, a health tied loan investment. Again, Nigerian innovative bankers were very quick to support us. A few of the bankers began to support us to say, okay, so if we can act, act as a, buff, a buffer guarantee for a screened person who belongs to a community hub that is recognized, then they will be able to advance the risk funding so that they can access healthcare and bounce back economies. Um, it's early days yet, and we are learning a lot. 
But let me also quickly give you a few highlights of what we have learned. One, there's no help without money. I think the concept of free health without money means we don't pay at the point of contact. It doesn't mean that there's no money. Somebody somewhere must have paid for that free at the point of contact somewhere. And so we're beginning to organize citizens and communities to think about self-reliance and self-interest, even at citizens' hub level. The citizens' hub is about 3,000, 3, 4,000 people. The largest citizens' hub is in Oshun State, and there are about 5,000 people. They have to organize themselves to finance their own recovery and to finance their own access to healthcare, and they can, and they are doing so. They are doing so, and they are paying back their investments that they, that they, that, that they have the investment we have made in them. Two, social capital is important, but social investment capital is what we need. Aid is transitioning to trade, and we need to be nimble about how we access social investment capital to the last mile, not just to people who produce drugs, but also to the people who will purchase the drugs from them. Because if you don't, if you produce the drugs, the pharmaceutical companies are getting all the money for the recovery, but the recovery of those who purchase the drugs from them is lagging behind. So citizens need to be able, the, the access to investment needs to, uh, needs to extend to the glass mile. So how do citizens through civil society organizations and social enterprises access social impact investment and social impact grants? And so we're working to, to expand our access to that. Finally, on the issue of equity, our citizens don't recognize equity. The first thing they told us was that if it's not available, the question of equity doesn't really, rejection or equity doesn't really reach them. So there was no demand, no citizens demand to force our governments to also go forward, to go beyond and join the global vaccine equity discussion, which was really a sad thing. So we began to also educate citizens on equity and their role in, in bridging the equity demand through speaking up. It's not only Sorosoke when it goes wrong. Sorosoke, I beg your pardon, means speak up. So Soros, it's not only to Sorosoke when you want something, you also need to Sorosoke on behalf of government to say, we need this vaccine, it's not getting to us. We need these vaccines, it's not getting to us. And when it gets to us, we, we really don't have the services that can, that can deliver it to us. So citizens began to organize themselves around three areas. One, access to medical supplies and the basic care package of care. Two, financing to, to access, to bounce back and build better. And three, equity discussions at the very local level, understanding that there's a difference between North and South, East and West, rich and poor, that you can engage in at that very local level. What's the consequence and impact that we have? First, we have gone from 10 community, 10 citizens hubs to 21 citizens hubs and counting. We just don't have the resource to do much more. We'd be happy to do much more. We have 21 citizens hubs now. Two, in those citizens hubs, we have self-reliant hubs of women and young girls who have been trained in it, who have been trained, have been given financial inclusion support and financial services support by the banks and a generous social impact investor who invested in us. And they are growing by themselves now in an organic way. Three, vaccine equity and all forms of equity are very critical. But first, vaccine equity in our countries must engage citizens in their voices. We've learned that from HIV AIDS. We've learned that from polio. The way we engage citizens is very critical to their demand for vaccine equity and for any form of equity. It's very important for us to continue to have those community conversations. And that is a role civil society and uh, social enterprises can, can play. What's the politics of it? Why is it under policy and politics? Well, it's under policy and politics because there's nothing new about what we're saying about engaging citizens. There's no new policy we need to write in Nigeria. Of, I, and I dare say anywhere else about the importance of putting citizens first, but no intervention in COVID-19 puts the infodemic that they suffered first put the citizens' voices at the center, he put the vaccine first before the citizens' voices. As we rebuild and recover, can we please engage citizens and get their in input into the voices as voices of, that are critical to the way we design recovery interventions and to the way we roll it out across Africa, including e equity discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Lola. Okay, Patrick, I'm over to you and you have the hard job. You're wrapping us up on this panel. Um, 
localization, um, which is meant to be more inclusive, more equitable, um, as well as um, ensuring that equity that we've been talking about financing wise goes across. So can you talk a little bit about this whole decolonization, localization, and is that leading to more money? Because this, this is about politics and money. Is it leading to more money for the people who need it? There you are. Thank you very much, uh, Crystal. Uh, thank you, distinguished panelists. Uh, such uh, very rich uh, discussions. Uh, Patrick Kagurusia, my name is, I'm the country director for AMREF in Uganda. I'm representing Dr. Githinji and I bring his apologies for not being able to be here. Um, Crystal, has the decolonization uh, really happened? Um, I think this is a conversation that uh, is perhaps uh, happening just this decade. And uh, I think we need to really discuss and see how we, we really decolonize uh, global health. Africa and the global south happen to be in the, uh, maybe the unfortunate position of having um, lost resources to the global north. And what we get in return is sort of a prescriptive uh, type of uh, medicine, public health and global health interventions that assume that um, the developing world is not capable of uh, solving its own, own problems. But uh, COVID-19 really showed shown a light on how uh, the global health has actually been colonized. Uh, we, we saw that um, the way the health system, the global health system is organized, for example, in the manufacture of, of vaccines, manufacture of PPEs, the regulations and patenting uh, tend to fix uh, these resources to, uh, to, the, to the North, uh, the rich and the powerful. We also see the practices uh, on global health like who gets the vaccine, who, who, where it's distributed, well, who gets it first, who gets it later, um, is focused uh, on and equally with the people who are powerful in this hierarchy. So indeed, those who have the resources right now globally are those who benefit uh, from uh, remedies on the current uh, global health threats. So, what we think as AMREF is that we must have this conversation of decolonizing um, the global health. We must know that even right now, uh, the global South, Africa to be specific, has the capability to think, to understand the health uh, interventions that, that, that they need. And as you, you probably could tell, the current outbreaks uh, live around COVID are emerging from Africa. Look at Ebola, for example. Uh, and Africa, of course, is going to be the next hotspot for uh, new outbreaks. Uh, we think that, uh, therefore, there must be really um, a change in the paradigm of thinking about global health. One is that the power really must uh, shift, shift uh, to, towards the global southern countries so that uh, the poor can also make their voice heard, can receive resources, to strengthen the system, strengthen the way they, they are able to implement solutions. Of course, Laura spoke very well. If you engage communities, they can come up with their own solutions. What they only need are the resources to facilitate them to do that faster. We must also look at a multilateral approach so that when interventions are being looked at, then Africa, uh, uh, Southern America should be on the same table and should have the same voice um, with uh, the countries in the global north. The WHO must re re shift and redesign the distribution of resources of health to ensure that uh, the global south and those uh, who are enriched at the last mile actually get uh, get get uh, health. You saw uh, how global southern countries had to wait for vaccines to arrive there. Uh, why can't it be that if there's an outbreak, then uh, somebody looks at the equitable distribution of these doses because the next the lives to be lost are going to be lost everywhere, especially in a, in a pandemic. We must take the concept of uh, development, human rights, and justice. Um, yeah, but indeed, Peter said <laughs> we have to learn to love ourselves that to wait for others to love us. But we are in a situation where there is uh, an equal distribution of resources, and uh, uh, and uh, we must make sure that the, the deliberate effort for these resources to be distributed uh, equally. Um, we must also uh, look at uh, the principle of uh, shared prosperity and shared 
responsibility. Because if the global south is going to remain uh, without resources, poor, you will see um, the trends we've seen before, migration to the north, and then it, it will be a problem to the northern countries as well. So we must now look at the shared prosperity so that there's both prosperity here in, um, in, in Africa and also, of course, the continued prosperity in the north. Uh, we must also build a global consensus, therefore, on how to uh, remove these inequities uh, that uh, are across, across the world and they remove this uh, colonial uh, remnants that uh, we still experience in our society. So the last question you asked, um, decolonization, is it realizing uh, uh, more money? Uh, not yet, because even the decolonization itself is not happening. So there must be uh, a conversation uh, around how do we make sure that uh, resources uh, to respond to pandemics, to achieve uh, universal health coverage are distributed equitably uh, through the, uh, the throughout the, 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 the continent, especially uh, for the global south. Um, we we already had that we shall be having uh, uh, an Africa Health Agenda International Conference in Rwanda. We'll be very glad in March uh, next year to really continue this conversation so that we can um, achieve a decolonization, a decolonized uh, global health. Over to you, Christopher. Thanks, Patrick, and awesome comments and really excited to, you know, have just such a wealth of a diverse points of view, but all get back to the same thing is one, we have to work together. Two, we have to treat people with equity and three, we got a lot of work to do. So it, it all comes together. I just wanted to take the one question I got in the Q&A, which is thanks for the interesting discussion and important civil society perspectives. What are you seeing in terms of funder a long-term commitment to help address the intrinsic, intrinsic uh, constraints to local resourcing for low and middle income countries for immunization day-to-day -day program operational needs. This is not new for COVID-19. It was raised back in the ministerial conference on immunization in Africa in 2016, but not addressed and COVID-19 exacerbated it. But that question, I have another question and I will pull that up to whoever wants to address it, toss that up. I, I, I think to, to I think Peter mentioned this. You know, we need to see how we can localize some of this production of uh, thing. I mean, we are we are the generation that has been blessed by this crisis. Let's not waste it. Our kids will condemn us if we don't come out of this crisis better than we went in. And I think what what I personally believe and what to try and do is how do we especially try and mobilize local capital, local private capital? Because let's face it, the money, the people with the money call the shots. Uh, and, and we have enough local private capital to find some of these things around vaccine manufacturing uh, and, and stuff like that. So, so we should be able to, to do that. Now we can use some of the international money as catalytic capital to help with just attracting and crowding in some of this stuff. But we need to see how we can especially unlock local private capital. So that's a big thing. Um, otherwise, so long as we're dependent on foreign capital uh, for some of these things, uh, it's going to be a challenge for us to, to call the shots on, on, on even... The, the, our needs. And, and part of this is for us to think as Africans to say, do we need to have a factory in each country? Maybe not. Maybe as a, as a couple of countries, we can come together and put money and build one manufacturing plant in East or West or Southern Africa uh, that serves the continent, but then prior, prioritizes our needs in essence. So I think that mindset of, of owning our own destiny through the resources, uh, mobilizing local resources is a big thing we need to do differently. Wow, good point. Any other one more response to this one? I have a few more questions yeah. for you. Yes, I, I also think that at the part of mobilize, it's critical to mobilize private capital, but it also to make, ensure that the private capital goes beyond industry to people, because people also need to bounce back businesses, bounce back economies, and to, to purchase and to support operational day-to-day -day cost of a healthcare system. So the risk health, local capital, and get it to people, get, promote financial inclusion and financial and services, especially to women and young people, so that they can purchase the healthcare that they need and they're not waiting for freebies. All right. Um, another question is for Lola, Frank, um, or Patrick, what are your thoughts on financing health through and development through the global public investment movement? It is the movement evolving, evolving beyond aid and leveraging significant increase international public finance to meet the common needs that we all care about. Familiar with that? Um, I'm going to answer like a layman and Frank can help me out here. 
I think one of the things I learned from COVID is that there's nothing called common public goods unless we change the definition of solidarity. If the EU can stop PPEs from getting to the nurse in Nigeria, to the health worker in Nigeria, it will always think of its people first. Is this right? Is this wrong? It became a moral dilemma for me. So I think that just like Peter has said, the first thing we should look at is to protect our own people. And so if you look up to global public goods to protect your own people, you won't go to the table with the correct negotiation. You go to the table, the global table with dependency negotiations rather than partnership negotiations. I think this is a message we need to do, uh, do uh, make all efforts to get to our political leaders, the uh, ambassadors of the UN to say self-interest does not exclude partnerships. It means that you go to the table with a partnership model, not a dependency model. Most of our negotiations of those global tools instruments now are based on a dependency model of negotiation. How do we shift that negotiation? And we urgently need to do that from dependency model of negotiation to a partnership model of negotiation. And that I think would respond to that question. Anybody else want to comment on that? Most importantly, we need to realize that we've got to mobilize our own resources. We've got to find our own capital locally um, and stop this thing of going to, uh, you know, with, with begging cups in hand. We, we've, we've got money that we just use inefficiently in other ways. If we mm -hmm. can use that money in our governments, for example, a lot more uh, um, efficiently, we don't, we, our financing gaps are not as huge as we think we are, but we've just, we lose too much money with inefficient processes and, and investments on this continent. Right. And there's another, Laura Sh uh, Ship uh, made a comment about long-term investments versus immediate needs, uh, which is the other question um, that came up for um, Emily around investment. How do you, when you have short-term or I guess you have uh, immediate needs, how do you ensure investments are made um, long-term that people don't get caught up in the short-term? Which I think kind of follows on along on that question. And they want to take, take us that, that with yeah. yeah. Well, Frank, uh, you and then Emily, you want to follow up? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I look at um, healthcare planning and planning for resources is not any different than what we've done in other sectors. Uh, mm -hmm. And and some governments do this quite well in other sectors. So I don't see why we struggle to do this in healthcare. Uh, and I think it's just a matter of, of how we prioritize what we need to be doing. Um, with, with some of these sectors. Uh, and, and sometimes I think we sit back hoping that aid will come to rescue us. Um, uh, and we should not. We, we age, the, the reality is that aid is declining. We've got to live with that. Um, and, and those old pots of capital are not going to be here for, for, for forever. So we need to think differently. It's not an option. Um, and we need to get creative about how we do this. Do we need help? Yes, we can, need, we can get some help to think through some of the more creative models of how we can close the gaps and close the gaps more sustainably. And now is the time for us to be doing this. As I said, let's not waste the crisis. Peter, I thought you come off mute. You want to jump in here? Maybe uh, Emily should go first because you called okay. on her and then I'll come later. <laughs> Good. Um, I mean, I, I, I do think, I agree with Laura, the sort of need to make sure that we're looking at these things separately and not to say that one is more important than the other, right? It's the sort of, um, there's such need and also such interest in these longer term investments that change the model for the future. But what we saw during COVID was there was also such an underinvestment or a slow response to the sort of systems that deliver, right? As, as we would talk about them. So the health workers, the logistics costs, the the day-to-day -day recurrent things that are there in um the day you know that are, are there all the time and are also needed during an emergency and so if we don't um you know if we if we we don't you know one of the things that i think we've done very poorly as a community and certainly in the um when you when you bring ngo actors into the into the community of which you know i i fall into that category is not being clear and honest about costs. Um, and this is something that I think we all are accountable and responsible for. There is this real lack of desire to talk about cost. And I think it comes from a fear of sharing, you know, what is seen as sort of proprietary or 
but, but we can't expect governments to think about this differently. We can't expect them to finance differently. We can't expect them to do a lot of things that Frank is talking about if they are not clear about costs and what the system needs to look like, what that costs and how, and, and NGOs are unfortunately one of the groups that I think um, do a lot of work and don't share that information transparently and openly in a way that governments can then respond and think about what they do want to do, what they can afford to do, and what they want to integrate into their planning and into their financing in the future. Um, so that is something that I think is on all of us as well to make sure that we are being transparent and strong partners in building a system differently in the future. And part of that is having conversations about costs and sharing that information transparently and widely. And it's something that we um, have really brought into our work and will we'll continue to bring into our work and then really encourage others to do the same. I'm not sure that entirely answers Laura's question, but I think it gets at some of the like systemic issues that contribute to us not, you know, then governments not being able to finance what they need moving forward as well. So Peter, I'll let you have the last comment before we go to our closing. I mean, I think uh, just to echo what, well, actually what both Lola and Frank and Patrick and Emily, what they're all saying, we have to strike a better balance between charity and self-reliance. That's the principle. Mm -hmm. And you can play that principle out in all kinds of ways. Citizens have to demand those rights. You know, if a child doesn't die of acute lymphocytic leukemia in Dallas, Texas, because it's completely curable, a child shouldn't die of acute lymphocytic leukemia in Abuja. So that's, that's where it starts from. That's what citizens have to demand. And by the way, to my way of thinking, you can think about that as primary care. It doesn't have to be, it's completely curable. Same with the uh, cesarean section. On the finance side, to me, it starts with domestic public finance because that is the translation of that political commitment into domestic treasuries governments. But then very quickly, you lay on a capital stack. Well, what about domestic private finance and how can that reinforce it for capital things? And then get to the international finance, philanthropic. And you know, one of the most interesting things that happened, and I'll stop here because a concrete example, is $500 million from the European Investment Bank going to uh, African governments for primary health care in the form of a long-term concessional loan with, uh, with uh, WHO helping to guide that technically, and then ultimately layering on um, uh, you know, impact investing, private capital, guaranteeing that risk, et cetera. That's the direction. So it starts with politics, it goes to finance, but it's all on the same philosophical foundation, which is equity, 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 <laughs> political choice, good governance, because conflict's not very good for health at all, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and on from there. So it starts with that foundation, we build upon it. And maybe I'll just end here. Maybe the craziest thing I ever see is if I'm Canadian, if we think about you know, the prosperity of Canada, uh, we start with an economic policy that has innovation and procurement and we just have to think the same way in every country. I was so delighted to see African presidents demanding procurement of, uh, for example, African-made vaccines and drugs from Gavi and Global Fund, et cetera, because that's how to think about economic policy and, and innovation policy. And it comes down to the same thing. Just love yourself, love your neighbor, treat, us, treat everyone equally, and don't other people. You know, it's not those poor people over there. We're all the yeah. same. And we just mm. have to think about each other from the same fundamental uh, starting point, and and then we will, and then we will be able to work uh, together. And and I'm very proud to be at a WHO that's led by an African girl who starts with that very premise. Thank you. Perfect, perfect comments. I love it. Love yourself, but love others the same. Um, so we have the pleasure of having the ambassador, uh, the Ghanaian ambassador to the U.S., Ambassador Herwin Mill who is going to join us in the perfect example of politics and health coming together. Um, and we are delighted to have her give some closing remarks and then over to uh, Vicki Okwan, who is the executive director for the Alliance for Reproductive Health and Rights based in Ghana. And then we will, who will close this out for today. So over to you, Ambassador. 
Um, thank you very much, Crystal. And I must say, I am not the ambassador. The ambassador is uh, Alima Mahama, Hajia Alima Mahama, but she couldn't make it here today because um, she had to deal with some other national engagements. I am the political, I'm the minister counselor, I'm a political officer at the embassy, but in a previous assignment, I served as the Ghanaian delegate on the WHO and the UNAIDS. And I think uh, I'd like to thank everybody. I mean, this is a very insightful discussion and I, I have some of my points that have already, already been mentioned, but my goodness, this is really good. I just, uh, I would be speaking on uh, integrating health security into global health and diplomacy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set out a few perspectives of how governments see health now, a few examples of how we, we've integrated a health uh, and health security into uh, global politics and then diplomacy, and then give a few examples of how these could be done even, even better. So, I mean, the first, as we know, governments are fully aware that a healthy population uh, plays a major role in the success of their, of their governance or how they rule a nation. And then we also very, um, we are aware of the interrelatedness of the relations between political power and the people and the health of, that, they, that they have. That if you have a sick nation, obviously your government would be seen as a, as a weak nation. The other thing that we have become aware of is, uh, is that citizenry through the power of democracy are now demanding for the best in terms of health. Now, you had a case where countries that are even endemic have diseases that are endemic to their societies are even call, calling for better management of these diseases. And I'm not even talking about pandemics or public health emergencies of international concern. You can have an, an area that is prone to brutally ulcer. And if it's not managed well, people will call you out because they are becoming aware of, of this partly because of the job of CSOs, and then also because of the, the, the wave of social media. The other issue too is that diseases can be weaponized now. What you think is happening in just, the, in just your, your backyard could be weaponized and used somewhere else on the continent, somewhere else in, in the world. So governments are becoming aware of the close relationship between the health of the population and the success of their government. In fact, how you manage a crisis, a health crisis in your, in your own backyard, in your own country, um, tells on you and on the international scene that if you don't manage it well at, at home, people will call you out, not just at home, but on the international scene. Now, a few examples of how um, global health has been integrated into um, global politics, I mean, health security has been integrated into global politics and then uh, diplomacy. I think the first example I'd like to go to is the international health regulations. Now, this set out for how to de detect, assess, report, and then treat cases that come up of diseases that break out. It was a very good example of how countries came together, developed national core capacities. Now, I'm sure Dr. Singer would, um, would, uh, would bear me out that not all the countries were able to develop the national core capacities as would have been wanted. But then with the, with the, with the uh, impact of COVID-19, these are being reassessed and countries are asking for help on how to develop these national core capacities, build the better laboratories, and then um, find a way to chase after the next disease X. The other thing that I would also want to speak about is that an example of how uh, global health, I mean, health security was integrated into the, into global politics would be HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS was groundbreaking. HIV AIDS showed us how vulnerable we all are even before Ebola, Zika, and and then um, what we have now, the COVID-19. Now, ideally the UN system, the UN Security Council system, every, every issue was discussed at a particular place and health was, was with ECOSOC. But with HIV AIDS, we had it moved to the Security Council. It was the first health crisis to be discussed at the Security Council. Then of course we had Ebola and then we had Zika 
and then we had COVID-19. Now, these were not discussed by health ministers. These were discussed by presidents. And I, sometimes the impact is lost on, on us. When you move the discussion to that level, he's not only discussing um, a president who, or a representative of a country, is not only discussing as a president, but as a commander in chief of the armed forces. So that puts it on a very different scale. We saw that, and then there's the other one of, um, another example will be the global financing mechanisms. Of course, I'm not gonna speak about the parameters of how to access these because that can be quite, can be quite controversial. But I mean, rich countries on one side and poor countries on one side, we all realize that, listen, if we do not help people access good health, treat diseases that are, are, are coming up, it will come back to, to harm us. That's why we have mechanisms like um, Gavi, Global Fund, and then the medicine, uh, medicine patent pool, CEPI. CEPI. CEPI started its work. Let me, just, uh, let me just get the full meaning of CEPI here, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. These were started by governments. I recall India and South Africa being one of the core group members of the people that put CEPI to, together. These are the ones who are chasing after the next disease X. So as to health security being in the forefront of global politics, I mean, it's, it's, it's a no, it's a no brainer. It's, it's happening. It's taking place now. Countries are fighting for diseases that you've never even heard of. I had someone put across a resolution for NOMA during the World Health Assembly. I mean, this is, countries are, are, are doing everything possible to push the discussion forward. Another, another example I probably would give would be, um, the global health security agenda. Yes, so I wouldn't speak so much on that because I sort of falls in line with the international health regulations. What I would like to get to now is um, how we can, we can do this better. And the first thing I'd like to go to is access to medicines, access to diagnostics, access to vaccines and treatment. And when I say treatment, I want to add essential surgery to that because we always seem to think treatment would be maybe popping a pill or having, a, but sometimes a simple suture of a wound is, is, is a medical procedure that is very vital to people. And with this, I would like to point to the uh, high level panel on access to medicines, the report that came out in 2016. I know uh, Mr. Patrick, uh, Mr. Patrick of Amref have spoken about access and how there's a strong divide between the developing and the, and the developed. Now, in the room of the public health care system, uh, Dr. Singer said it was, it was a house and there are several rooms in there. Now, one of the major rooms in there is, is medicines. And the truth is that governments in most parts of the world do not have access to, to, to advanced medicines, even to the basic ones that have come. And this is true for HIV. This is true for vaccines as we're seeing it now. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we realized we all saw how people were stockpiling and it wasn't people from the developing countries. Now, yes, we must love ourselves because no one else will come to love us. But sometimes what we are asking for is not maybe love. We just want to shove in the right direction, make it as, as, as violent as you possibly want it to, to, to be. But there's some systemic, there's some systemic uh, bottlenecks that exist that makes it difficult to, um, to access these. Another one would be um, looking at pooling. We can pool for vaccines we can pull for vaccine manufacturing. Countries can come together and pull for vaccine manufacturing. But how come that discussion is not, is not, making, is not making so much headway? Francophone Africa, Anglophone Africa. We can come together as Frank Anglophone Africa and try and pull for manufacturing of essential drugs, essential diag diagnostics and essential uh, vaccines. But we don't see that discussion gaining so much traction. 
So, and I'm speaking to a group of uh, civil society organizations here. So maybe one thing I'd like to put across is the, the high level panel on access to medicines, the report is, was released in September, 2016. That's one of the things that maybe we should look at and pushing it across. Another example I would like to uh, speak about, I think that would be my second, is the importance of civil society organizations. I learned about HIV AIDS through civil society organizations. I'm sure the government mechanism was around and was doing its job, but as a young person, that's how I learned through HIV AIDS. The kind of active activism we saw for HIV AIDS in the 80s and in the 90s was, was mind blowing. And we should not lose sight of that. Half the time, governments have issues with civil society organizations. We are questioning your funding, we are questioning what your motives are, and we are always saying that the priorities do not fall in line with, 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 with the government. But the truth is that most of the time, you go into the villages, you go into the hinterlands, you see what is being done there, and then you bring it to the fore. Do not stop making that noise in quotes. Do not stop making that noise. And then let's keep the partnership going. There should be a partnership between government and civil society because most of these civil societies speak on behalf of the people. So let's keep that one going. And then by all means, as we get caught up, as we get caught up in uh, what is happening now, now we are all speaking about COVID-19, um, we should not lose sight of what was the health issues that were existing before COVID-19. How are we tracking those? Are they, are they meeting the, the, the targets that we wanted them to, to meet? Now talk about, we have HIV AIDS. Now that's, that, that would be the mother in the room. So are we on, on, on track with those targets? The children that were born with microcephaly from Zika, are we tracking them? Is civil society keeping the engagement on them going? You know, those are the issues that we want to bring up. You do not make us lose sight of what is important. The other one I would speak about is information flow and transparency between governments and its people, between the people and its government and the civil society. It should be, I wouldn't call it a three-way, it's, it's just should be zigzag across the room and everybody should know what is going on. Oftentimes information um, is mostly overly managed before it goes to the population, but people need to know what is out there. Because if you don't, mark, if you don't let people, make people aware of what is happening in your country, up to the minute information. Help is not going to come. You should make the people aware. I mean, we saw this with COVID-19 and uh, I'd have to use the example of the president of the Republic of, of, of Ghana. He was giving up to the minute information, most of the times even on a weekly basis of how the, uh, the, the tracking and tracing was going, what was being done, the parameters that were put in place. So this information is, the, the, the importance of information flow to the people is very important. And we don't want, we want WHO to be in the forefront when it comes to global politics. I mean, global health security in global politics and in diplomacy. We want WHO to be in the forefront. We want the, the reliable information to come from WHO. We want to see it as what we are part of and the information coming from them is what we can rely on. And during the, you know, in the thick of COVID-19, we had information coming from all sorts of places. And we, we were wondering which one is which one is is the correct one. So that is where I am going to leave you with. I mean, the half of my examples would be in Ghana, but I'd rather let it go and then probably take a few questions, if that's possible. Thank you. Um, I think I have to jump in here. Thank you very much, Leila. That was really insightful, very um, interesting. And we definitely have taken note of the many important lessons you shared. I think we are going to just have to quickly go through the call to action. We cannot share the lessons with, oops. 
Oh, sorry. Yes. So, um, sorry. The call to action includes um, reimagining primary health care. And under that, we have infodemic management, upskilling the health workforce, community and mid level, primary health care, looking at the supply chain management and access. And then the whole question about integration, which has come out a lot in today's conversation. And then citizens, youth inclusion, and gender equity. We also, um, this looking at the huge issue of financing, which has come out in all the discussions. It's come out in equity, it's come out in supply chain management. You know, it's just cut across the various aspects of today's conversation. And then global health solidarity and diplomacy. And the last thing is um, looking at health security across uh, various levels, looking at country voices and global NGOs, economic power with a focus on self-sufficiency, decolonization and localization. And then um, again, under health security, we are calling on governments to engage in sustainable financing for health security strengthen the different components of the health system that impact the health security of nations, and then strengthen partnerships and collaboration for security. And then lastly, which is what I love best, reimagine international cooperation and diplomacy to secure health and social protection systems against future pandemics and save lives. This is at the heart of redefining global security. Thank you very much. Crystal?